Well, well, greetings to you tonight, and here in Wimbledon, in South London, and we're also greeting our, our friends in New Jersey, and it's the annual meeting of the Dean Bergen Society. Dean Bergen was down here at Chichester during the eight, late 1800s, and when the modern version uh, movement really began, he took a stand against it. He had very few friends that went with him, but he was that lone voice, and there's often a lone voice that stands up and speaks up. And so in America, for uh, many years, they've had what is known as the Dean Bergen Society. This is their annual meeting, and we're very, very thankful for them. As a matter of fact, it's a very special meeting because it's the 40th anniversary of the Dean Bergen Society, and as it turns out, uh, we want to really give a, a big hello to, to Dr. D.A. Waite, uh, who founded it, who has stood in the gap over these many, many years uh, in the defense of our Bible and the preserved words of Scripture beneath it that, uh, upon which it's based. But um, I've got 12 points tonight. This is going to be a roller coaster. I'm not sure whether we're both going to stay on track or not, but we're going to make every attempt. It's a strange story. The basics of the modern version controversy are not difficult, the, the actual basics of it. There are two supposedly very old manuscripts, Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Codex Sinaiticus right here in London on the Euston Road in the British Library, Codex Vaticanus in the, the Vatican Library. And these are supposed to date back to about the year 350. And the modern versions are based upon these two manuscripts with help from about 40 other manuscripts. A couple of problems. They're not cohesive. They don't agree. The 40 other manuscripts will probably support the King James almost as much as it supports these. So it's not cohesive. Also, they greatly weaken the, the uh, doctrinal heart of the Bible. And uh, uh, so that's one of the big differences. It has fewer words. Key doctrinal phrases have been omitted. God created all things, Ephesians 3, 9. That's where it stops. King James, God created all things by Jesus Christ. That's the type of thing that's missing. So you've got missing words. Then you have the King James Version, our King James Version, based upon about 5,300 manuscripts. That's about how many we've got that would support the text of the King James Bible. 5,300, they are cohesive. And yet there's just enough difference in them to let you know that they're not copies of each other. It's not like a duplicating machine. But they're representatives that really they are representatives of a long line of transmission that goes deeply into the past. You stop and think about that. Uh, the manuscript basis of the King James Version is very remarkable indeed. Not lateral copies, deep transmission into the past. So that which is true, is it the two old manuscripts, doctrinally weakened, support from about 40 other manuscripts, or is it the vast majority of manuscripts that were copied everywhere and spread around the world and so that's the, that's the issue. That's our first point. The second point is this. What if one, and actually both, but we're only dealing with one tonight. What if one of these two manuscripts doesn't really date back, like they say, to the year 350? What if it's much more recent. That's our 
issue our title tonight. And we have these notes, and these notes will be made available to you. This is 50 pages of notes. Was Codex Sinaiticus written, I should have said 350, according to whatever yet one else believes, was it written in 1840? What? How could such a thing possibly be? That is our subject tonight. On the front page here, we it's what did the news what was Codex Sinaiticus written in 1840? What the newspapers reported. Why worldwide coverage greeted the 18 the 1933 arrival of Codex Sinaiticus at the British Museum in 1933, December the 27th, 1933. A crowd of about 3,500 were there to greet it. Here's a newspaper report. They went in, they looked at the manuscript, they were able to see it, and one of the points made, visitors generally were amazed at the good condition. Uh, the preservation, the clearness of the manuscript. And then they talked about what it cost. It had been a bargain. At a, They bought it from Russia. It had been a bargain at a hundred thousand pound. I understand a hundred thousand pound would approach something like seven million pounds today. They paid too much. They really paid too much. That's our second point. What if one of them, really both, is not so old after all? It doesn't go way back to 350. Number three, nothing is stranger than the story that unfolds a detective writer could never write a stranger story than what we're about to tell you about this manuscript that was supposedly discovered in 1844 in a monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai, and the monastery was a Greek Orthodox monastery. There's going to be three stories here tonight. There's the story of the man who said he found it. Tischendorf, a, a, a Lutheran, a young Lutheran, a, a brilliant man, a scholar on a search for manuscripts, finds it in a monastery at the bottom of the traditional Mount Sinai, 1844. It's in a bag, it's in a, a, a big container uh, of waste paper, strange place to find a valuable manuscript. They say it was about to be burned. People question that, but we are giving you, we are telling you what was reported in the newspapers at the time. That's what they tell us. Okay. He says, I found it. In fact, there's another, we've got two Constantines here. We've got another Constantine by the name of Constantine Simonides a seller of manuscripts who says, no, you didn't, you didn't, uh, you found it, yes, but I wrote it. I wrote it at Mount Athos Monastery, northern Greece, in 1840. It was to be a decorative copy written in the old large-lettered script for the Tsar Nicholas I of Russia, who was the patron of our monastery, who had done so much for our monastery, but actually we wanted him to do a little bit more, and we wanted a printing press, and so we got some other manuscripts together and made this beautiful decorative copy for him. And then... Uh, we have a third 
force, we have a third uh, story here. The Vatican is involved. The Pope says, this is Pope uh, Gregory the 16th. The Pope says, no, we support this man. He's searching for manuscripts. He's found an ancient one. Simon Otis says, it's not ancient. It's only a couple of years old. I wrote it. I wrote it. So, that is the strange story that unfolds. And everyone is telling their story, and I think to begin with, at least, Simonides believes his, Simonides believes his story. Tischendorf believes his story. In the background, the Vatican is getting very active. That is a key part. Number four, number four. We'll tell you something about this. We won't go to the very beginning to begin with, but we will tell you something about this manuscript that immediately lets you know it has a major, major flaw, a major problem, which at the outset puts a huge question on how old it is. In 18, and we're going to look at, uh, we'll look at three dates here. We're going to look at 1844 when Tischendorf says, I found it. And then we're going to look at 1855. And then we're going to look at 1859. So keep those three dates in mind. And then I'll take you to 1862 to round something off. 1844, he found it. He found it. And he begins to promote Codex Sinaiticus. He takes 43 leaves with him and gives it to his benefactor. His benefactor is a very interesting person. He, he, he takes it and he begins to promote it. And, and Tischendorf, there's a push now. Uh, we've had the Reformation Bibles spreading around Europe, but there's a push for a revised Bible. We want something different. And Tischendorf was at the forefront of that, and he's looking for early manuscripts and something that would be different than the manuscript that our King James Bible is based upon. And so 1844, in 11 years later, and in a totally unrelated uh, event, Simonides, a seller of manuscripts, the two men don't know, the two Constantines don't know each other. Simonides, he's a seller of manuscripts. People have questioned, did he, was he a forger? That's a great debate. One thing is, he, whether you'd ever invite him to your birthday party, I'm not certain. But he was a brilliant, brilliant man. No question about it. And uh, you can read that, uh, whatever else could be said. But Simone, Simonides is on a trip, and he's selling manuscripts, and he goes to Leipzig, which is the capital of Saxony, in uh, east, uh, the separate country at that time, in, in, in East Germany, near the Polish border. And he's got a copy of an early something we would not be interested in. It's called The Shepherd of Hermas. It's, it's an apocryphal story. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It's of no value to us. But to anyone interested in early writings in the, in the uh, post-Christian uh, era would be interested perhaps in it. Everything that they'd ever seen before was in Latin, written late. Simonides has a Greek copy. Nobody ever seen a Greek copy. He takes it to Leipzig University. They're amazed. He says it goes way back, maybe third, second century. They're amazed. The learned academics there immediately publish it. Wow but it's short-lived. They jumped before they looked. 
shortly left before shortly thereafter Tischendorf sees what they've just published he says that's a fake that's a fake it's this this is the shepherd of Hermas but it's just merely a late Greek translation of the Latin this is only hundred years old at the most. It doesn't go back. Great, but these are unrelated events. So he finds Sinaiticus in 1844, but he didn't get to see the whole manuscript then. 18, 11 years later, 1855, he pronounces this to be a fake. You know what's going to happen now? It's 1859. He goes back. Tischendorf goes back. He's well on the way to making a facsimile of Codex Sinaiticus as a companion to Codex Vaticanus, which is at the uh, Vatican Library, but he really hasn't had his hands on all of the manuscript yet. He goes back to Mount Sinai, he's given the whole, much of the manuscript, and he sees the end of it. And guess what he sees at the end of it? What Tischendorf sees at the end of his prized discovery? The shepherd of Hermas. The same shepherd of Hermas that Simodes sold to Leipzig. The same shepherd of Hermas, identical, that Tischendorf himself said was a fake. And if Tischendorf could have said, oh, it's been attached to the manuscript at the end at a later time, he would have done that, but he couldn't. It was on the same vellum. It was written in the same ink. It had even the same handwriting. It was an integral part of the manuscript. And the implications for Sinaiticus, if it's recent, Sinaiticus is recent too. And there is no way out of this. It's part and parcel. What is said of one is said of the other. What does he do? Well, I've had second thoughts. You know, I think I was a bit hasty. I think this is an ancient manuscript after all. And the world of academia gathered ranks around. I mean, we've, we've made so much progress in, in coming to a foundation for our new Bible that we want Vaticanus and Sinaiticus to be the foundation of it. We're not going to turn back now and we will just, yeah, oh yes, this is old. Oh, please, it's, it's as old as the hills. And that's where it went. And everybody accepted it and so we go on with our story. So that's number four, number four. Oh, number six, number number four also. I want you to just mention 1862 was the year when all of this made it into the mainstream news, i.e. the Guardian. Nobody knew a lot about each other. It was before the internet. Uh, news didn't travel that far but in 1862, there was a letter uh, written by Samuel Tregellis to Fenton Hort. You've heard of West Cotton Hort. Fenton Hort and Tregellis also were key movers, along with Tischendorf, for a revised text based on Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. And Tregellis was from the conservative side. He's the one we would agree with. Fenton Hort 
was from the liberal side. But Tregellis is writing, and he says, you know, wonderful progress we're making. You're making tremendous progress. We're moving on the revised text that will unseat this text that the King James Bible is based upon is, is moving rapidly. He says, and by the way, surely nobody, nobody believes this absurd story by this uh, Constantine Simonides that he wrote. Nothing could be so absurd as that. That lit a light, a fuse, a spark that ignited a debate that was then to last for a year. Simonides saw the letter, saw the entry in the Guardian. Simonides then writes to the Guardian on September 3rd, 1862. He says, I want to tell you my story. And he says, I was at Mount Athos. I had my uncle Benedict there with me. I had a friend by the name of Kalinikos, a monk there with me who saw me do it. He said, I, I put together a manuscript for the Tsar of Russia. He said, we completed it. It was beautiful. It was something fit for a king. He said, I took it then from there to Constantinople on the way to Russia. At Constantinople, the archbishop, all of these are Greek Orthodox now, saw it and said, uh, I think you need to check this. He wasn't happy with the New Testament part of it. And he said, before we give it to the Tsar of Russia, I think we better send it to another monastery, a monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai, traditional Mount Sinai, St. Catherine's, and let them look at it. And then he says, I went back to my, I'm selling manuscripts, I move around, and, and I, and in 1852, I came by Mount Sinai, and I saw Codex Sinaiticus, and I noticed it was darker. It looked like it had aged. It was kind of twisted and turned. It was no longer the beautiful, the, the name of the czar to whom it was addressed had been removed. Czar Nicholas's name was no longer on it. And uh, then he says, I've been hearing a little bit about this Tischendorf fellow about the manuscript that he says he discovered at Mount Sinai. And in 1859, he says, I saw his facsimile, what he actually put together, what he published on the... He said, I was up in Liverpool with my friends, and my friends in Liverpool showed it to me. And he said, I wrote that. That's my manuscript. And then, beginning in 1862, he starts writing letters. And then, point number six, everyone piled in. Everyone. Simonides wrote 19 letters, mainly to the Guardian. His friend Kalinikos wrote seven letters, saying he did write it. I saw him write it. J. E. Hodgkin, curator of the Mayer Museum in Liverpool. And by the way, uh, that, that museum became the, uh, its artifacts really were the, uh, the, the beginning of what became known as the World Liverpool Museum. It's one of the big buildings there in Liverpool it, that was built in 1860. So uh, Hodgkin, a very influential man, defended Simonides, when everyone else went against him, put his own, but he was a, an influential man. He says, you know, he did write it. As a matter of fact, they even challenged Tischendorf to a public debate. He wouldn't come. His opponents 
those pushing for revision and the newspapers generally. And you know today, the, liber the, the Guardian's always liberal. Well, it went against Sim uh, Simonides uh, totally. Uh, they said he couldn't have written it. He was too young because he's only about 20 when he wrote it. They, they attacked him on his age. It sounds absurd to begin with. Uh, they said his friend Kalinikos, that he says saw him write it, he doesn't exist. They said we've searched for him everywhere. We can't find him. They said uh, his uncle Benedict, we can't find that there was ever a Benedict at Mount Athos, so we think he's telling an entire story. By the way, by now you must wonder, where did I get all this information? That's my point number eight. This whole thing died. Tischendorf won the argument until 1982. And J. Uh, J. E. Eliot, a leader in pushing the modern Bibles, the critical text based on Vaticanus Sinaiticus, uh, professor of, of, um, of textual criticism at Leeds University, for reasons we do not know, pre-computer days decides to resurrect all of the newspaper articles. Nobody ever thought of this. Never heard of it. Resurrects them all and puts them all in for and everything Simonides wrote, everything written against them. Now he's against Simonides and he tends to cut Simonides' letters up and put a piece here and a piece there. He tends to bury them beneath all of the uh, accusation against him. Uh, but he wrote this book. Uh, in our paper here, what we've tried to do is give Simonides his day in court. We've taken his letters, we've presented them uh, chronologically, we've emboldened the key statements that he makes, and also Kalinikos, and also Hodgkin. And so we give it, and we give him his day in court. You're allowed to read them and you will find it's compelling. It's compelling. But were it not for this man, he leaves out some things, though. He misses some things. He's so copious, but he there was a, 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 a catalog published by Cambridge Press in 1895 called the Lambros Catalog that listed people who went to Mount Athos and who wrote there. 1840, 41, it mentions, and they even doubted that, that uh, Simon, Simonides had ever, Simonides had ever been at, at uh, Athos. They doubted that uh, he'd ever been to Mount Sinai. But the Lambros catalog says it mentions three men for 40 and 41. It mentions Simonides. It mentions Kalin Kalinikos. It mentions Benedict. Now why he left it out is a mystery because he's too smart of a man to do that. He should have put it in. All right, we're going on. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, point seven. That's point seven. The next point is point eight. There's, it's quiet still, but then some in our own group begin to get a hold of the story. The first to talk about it is Chris Pinta, who's been over here. I've spoken to him. I'm a friend of his. And he wrote A Lamp in the Dark. He, and he reopened. He's the first I know to reopen, and based on J.K. Eliot, he has presented anything that he presents, get. Very good. 
professionally done. He has, he'll show you, there's Westcott and Hort, and he'll show you Simonides. He's, he's got these actors. They don't actually speak, but the way he presents it, it is extremely good on the history of the Bible. He wrote this. In the, shortly after, a man by the name of Daniel Daniels began presenting uh, videos of the subject. But the first real book to be written is only written about a year and a half ago by a man who has often been associated with the creation movement down in Portsmouth. His name is Bill Cooper. He wrote this book, and it is outstanding. It, uh, I've gone through it twice. Uh, I, I nearly ruined two holidays with Dot reading it while we were on holiday. And uh, it, it was just absolutely astounding the amount of uh, material that he's got. So this book really got things going. More recently, uh, uh, David Daniels has written Is the World o Oldest Bible a Fake? And A Man in America, David Sorensen, has written Neither Oldest Nor Best. And uh, this, uh, these books are good. They're a great deal of material. If you want to study it, uh, they go way beyond where I've gone tonight. Okay, that's our point number eight. Point number nine, very important. A surge of interest in the Vatican. Oh, uh, uh, you know, the Vatican was always interested in the spread of the Bible. After uh, it was translated by Luther and, Zwing, uh, uh, and Zwingli and uh, Diodati in Italy and of Altian in, in France, and of course Tyndall here, and it was spreading around Europe, and it was called by the Vatican the paper pope of the Protestants. They hated it. People were turning to Christ. People were being saved. For the first time, many had the Bible. It wasn't just going to a heavy service and hearing it in Latin that they couldn't understand. People had the Bible in their own language. They knew they had to have an agenda to somehow undermine the Bible. They chose the manuscript route. If we can find early manuscripts that are different than the Protestant Bibles, then we can undermine faith in it. And so this young man, Tischendorf, sets out on a search. He's a Lutheran, but he's totally convinced we need to find a new Bible based on the oldest and the best manuscripts. He has a patron, a patron. Here's his patron. His patron is Frederick Augustus II, king of Saxony. Saxony is Protestant, but their kings are Catholic and the favorites of Rome. He says, I'll be your patron. I'll support you. You go out looking for manuscripts. And then wonderful things happen. 1843, this young Lutheran is given an invitation the year before he discovers Sinaiticus at Mount uh, uh, Sinai come and to meet guess who? The Pope. Just an accident. Come and meet the Pope. Pope Gregory the Sixth. Come to the Vatican. We'd love to meet you. We've heard what you're doing. And when he gets there, he's met by the uh, director of the Vatican Library, Cardinal Missofante. And Missofante says, oh, we've got a poem we prepared for your arrival. And I, I thought, wow, that's wonderful. And what's the poem about? Oh, he says, it's about you. So they're reading him a poem about himself as he walks into the Vatican. Now, that's never happened to me. I don't think it's ever happened to anybody in their whole life. 
And he's been, t- and then he said, we want to show you something. We want to show you this manuscript we've got. They show him Codex Vaticanus. Isn't it beautiful? He says, we need more like it. We need more like it. The following year, he discovers Sinaiticus. By the way, the year after that, this pope issues a ban, a condemnation, a a threat against all Bible societies. They're a curse to the world. And uh, so that's, that's, and so we've got this interest, this interest that, and it, it suddenly arises. There might be an added incentive uh, to, for the Vatican to have a, 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 an interest because it's Catholic teaching that the popes are the successors of the apostles. They are apostles. They are after Peter. And they are the successors. There's one problem that they have. They're not able to perform the miracles of the apostles. So isn't it remarkable that these two old manuscripts do not have the signs of the apostles that are uh, given at the end of Mark chapter 16. They cannot perform miracles. Did you know that those Two manuscripts that those that from verse nine to verse twenty of Mark sixteen is missing, in only these two manuscripts and one other that's number three o four that's in Paris. And did you also know that in order to do that it was a little bit tricky because they had to uh, replace some of the pages leading up to the missing portion. And when they replaced them, they had to rewrite them. And the same scribe that wrote it on the one wrote it on the other. Now that is collusion. That shows that is a demonstration of Vatican collusion. The next one, the next one, and we are going, I'm going to go over slightly here. I'm very sorry, very sorry. What did uh, Simon Odes copy from? in order to produce uh, Sinaiticus. What did he copy from? Let me say to you, when you deal with Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, you're dealing with another planet. There's nothing like them anywhere else in the world. There's no other manuscripts like them. They've got the doctrinal heart completely removed from Scripture. It reminds me, I know this is a terrible illustration. It reminds me there's a young boy, uh, when I want to talk, uh, over the years, whenever I want to demonstrate something that's really bad, I, I tell him about the time I went to see uh, Abbott and Costello meet the mummy. And it shows uh, the mummy chasing them under the pyramids, I guess it is. And, and, uh, they crying out, we've, we've seen a mummy, we've seen a mummy. And uh, Costello says, nobody's mummy ever looked like that. And uh, that's really, that's really what it, and th- there is nothing like this in the world. Nothing so bad. Where did it come from? The Greek Orthodox monasteries are all, much like our King James Bible. They, they were the keepers of manuscripts. And they're always like our Bible. The only thing, the, and here is the th- thing, when Vaticanus, I'm sorry, when Sinaiticus left Mount Athos Monastery, it was a, a manuscript gift fit for a king. It was beautiful. That means whatever, however it was done, it was corrupted. Somebody and slipped in, somebody was bribed, 
Simonides was only 20 when he was doing it. Somebody slipped in a manuscript that tore the doctrinal heart out of Scripture. He didn't recognize it. When he took it to Constantinople on his way to Russia, immediately they recognized it there. They took it back uh, to look at it at Sinai. At Sinai, they added a lot of corrections to the margin of it. The corrections in the margin overwhelmingly moved back to what we know in our King James Bible. But thereafter, sometime after 1850, this went through an aging process. It was white. Everyone says it was a totally white manuscript before. And then it suddenly darkened, like somebody spilt coffee on it. And it was then that no doubt Mark 16 was taken out. And so that is it. And by the way, by the way, I just need to tell you this. They found one other old manuscript that does now support Vaticanus. Papyri 75. I'd love to say to you, oh, they found it in the late 1800s. They were searching for manuscripts. Uh, there in the sands of Egypt, they found it. Not quite. A French Jesuit priest found it from a book dealer in Cairo, 1952. Nothing suspicious about that. It was then later donated to the Vatican Library. I'm sure it's a thing. Sure it's a thing. All right. Let's go on. We close now. I've gone over. I've missed my... The arguments went on. The arguments went on. We've just touched on them. For one year, Samadhi's story never changed. Uh, but everyone went against him. The press was against him. The Guardian especially was against him. Tischendorf won the argument. By the end of 1863, Simonides moves off saying nothing ever is heard of him. Tischendorf, Tischendorf receives all the accolades. The Greek, the modern New Greek text is published from which most modern versions are based on 1881. Although Tischendorf dies in 1875, but he receives honors and accolades. Simonides totally, totally uh, discredited, rubbished. Uh, the only thing we know about him, he died of leprosy in Egypt. And the story seemed to die with him. Not quite. Not quite. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be made known and come abroad. Today, this, what I believe, beyond question, is a true story, whether we've connected all the dots correctly, the basics of it are true. Um, stand by your King James Bible. There are, you'll be by far the better for it. God bless you.